it's good to see so many familiar faces in the room. Our friends of SAC, several board directors, our own board is here. Also, uh, several partners, as Bilin pointed out. And uh, thanks for finding the time this morning. And fun fact, I have three bosses in the room. I have my current boss, Rajiv, uh, who's the CEO at Stewardship Asia Center, and my two bosses at two previous organizations. And before you judge me, I haven't moved too many jobs. So in the last one decade, I've held only three jobs and all three bosses are here. What are the odds? And I'm glad they are on different tables because they don't discuss me. So uh, that's a good start. But let me start the sharing by setting the context and in fact asking us to reflect a little. Now there is several hundred years of board experience in this room uh, this morning and really thankful to you all for that. Now, if I were to ask you to think about a board in any jurisdiction, a board that has really hit the ball out of the park on ESG front, or an organization that has led decisive action on ESG, I'm sure a few names would jump out. Perhaps you're a part of such boards already. If I also ask you to think about a board that has come under fire uh, for spectacular governance failures, or organization that has come under a lot of criticism for not doing what it needs to do on ESG, I'm sure a few names will resonate. A few names jump out for me, but I'll, I'll, I'll stay away from naming organizations this morning. But I'm sure a few names come to your mind. Now, we all love to write about these organizations. We love to cover them in media. We love to, uh, you know, talk about these organizations in, uh, uh, in our prime time news channels. People like me would go out and write cases about these organizations. However, have you ever wondered how much time we spend on boards that are underperforming? Boards that can make a difference but choose not to. Or boards that can nudge their management teams to embrace the sustainability agenda more aggressively but choose to stand on the sidelines. Unfortunately, such boards comprise the belly of the normal curve. They are much more in number. And when we speak with such board directors, and we spoke with quite a few during our interview process, because those were anonymous conversations, we hear all kinds of reasons. Economy is tough, uh, you know, the global uh, business scenario is kind of crumbling, if you will. Organizations are witnessing unprecedented transformation. Geopolitics is uh, what we see around us. You know, things are, they are moving pieces all the time. And therefore, we'll come to sustainability. We understand sustainability is important. We understand that boards need to take action, but we'll come to that. There are bigger priorities to deal with at this point. In my mind, these are all excuses. In my mind, these are all pushbacks. Because inaction by the senior most team in the organization or lack of decisive action on sustainability is not acceptable in the times like these, not acceptable by our stakeholders, by our customers, by our vendors, by our suppliers, and hopefully some of your shareholders as well. In fact, I would go out on a limb to say that in times that we live in, if the board directors are standing on the sidelines saying that, hey, I did not create the problem or my organization is clean, Therefore, I am not accountable for doing much in solving the problem. In my mind, that borders on being unethical. So that's the context with which we started this research. We tried to understand what are boards doing in driving the sustainability agenda? What can we learn from boards that are further ahead of the curve? What is holding boards back as we talk about the sustainability agenda and so on? Before I share the key takeaways with you, let me take a moment to formally thank our partners who made this research possible. So um, as Bilin pointed out, we were really lucky to find 13 organizations across 11 countries to partner with us on this research. We at Stewardship Asia Center believe in the power of ecosystem, believe in the power of collaboration and interdependencies. And really glad that we found like-minded partners who helped us curate perhaps the biggest research in Asia Pacific at the intersection of boards and sustainability. I know some of you are here this morning, so if you could stand up and give me a chance to thank you formally, that'll be really nice. I know there are some partners, uh, Chiwe, Flossie, Eddie. I know we have a representative from IICD in Indonesia, our partners from India, our partners from uh, SID. 
And also Jane, my colleague, my partner in crime, who helped me write this research. She did all the hard work, and I stand here and look good. So thank you, Jane. And as I said, we've curated a research uh, covering over 700 board directors across uh, 11 countries. These board directors are all in for-profit, private, public, and state-owned enterprises across multiple sectors. Also, we've tried to reduce our footprint with this research. As you can see on your table, there are just one or two copies of research along with a QR code for you to download. So if you are intrigued by what you hear, feel free to download the research. But if you are somebody like me who likes to smell the print and feel the paper while consuming knowledge, there are a few copies on your table and there are some stacked behind you. So pick a copy on your way out, but only if you must, that's a request. So let me start by setting the context. Now, this is a very senior room and it'll be an underwhelming statement to make that sustainability is under siege in the times that we live in. We've all witnessed what happened in Dubai, what happened in Oman. In fact, our SAC team was in Dubai a day after the flooding happened and we witnessed some devastation firsthand. Similar uh, events happened in Americas, in Brazil in particular. Last year, I remember there was a week when seven cities were flooded in the same week. So uh, climate change is kind of steering us in our face, if you will. We've had forest fires in Australia, forest fires in India, on the foothills of the Himalayas, unprecedented. Uh, most countries are in, in South Asia, most cities in South Asia are witnessing unprecedented heat and the summer has barely started. So, you know, the, 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 the challenges owing to climate change are real and they are staring at us. Also, the difference between the haves and the have-nots is widening. The chasm is widening, if you will. Oxfam data suggests that 60% of the world is poorer today than before, which is about 5 billion people. Half the world lives on less than five and a half US dollars a day. Also, 69% of the wealth is concentrated in the developed countries as we speak. Um, the global conflicts are not making our job easier. And if anything, they are exacerbating the situation. So serious issues on uh, the social inequality front. Now these challenges, environmental challenges, climate change, uh, social inequality, these are not only existential challenges, these are business imperatives. Organizations that can, the, that can navigate these challenges are the ones that can leverage and benefit from the opportunity these challenges are throwing at us. They can bolster their bottom lines, they can set up their organizations to be future ready and uh, successful in the longer run. So that's the situation that we are living in. Now, as you think about it, you know, as, as we wrestle with these challenges, organizations that are able to um, embrace sustainability or those organizations that are seen or perceived to be sustainable, they can attract better talent. They have access to cheaper capital. They are able to build a better brand. Also, such organizations are able to engage their customers and their employees better, and data suggests that. While management teams go out and do their job and execute strategies, I think the tone at the top in the organization at the board level is super critical. In fact, I would say that organizations that have punched above their weight on sustainability, boards have a key role to play in driving sustainability decisively, or if nothing else, supporting the management in doing so. While we celebrate Paul Polmans of the world for what they have done in Unilever, we often forget you know, the boards that were standing rock solid behind the team. How many of us know who was the chair of Unilever during Paul Polman's time? Take a call, okay. So not many of us know, or, or some of you may know, that Michael Tesco, who was the chair, and his team was completely responsible of, uh, for backing Paul Polman when he was taking very difficult decisions in Unilever during his vintage or his tenure at Unilever. Case in point, a few years later, what happened in Danon, you know? Faber Emanuel, another poster boy, CEO of sustainability, he tried to do something similar that Paul Polman did in Unilever and a lot more. However, his board did not back him up. Eventually, he was let go. So the role that boards play is extremely critical. Also, I would say that if boards are ignoring to play a decisive role in driving sustainability, they do this at their own peril in the times that we live in. Now, shareholder resolutions against organizations are not uncommon in the ESG area. You know, some high-profile ones include uh, what happened at uh, 
Exxon, when engine number one, one of the activist investors got after them to change the composition of the board to bring more sustainability thinking in. Or what happened in Chevron when the shareholders pushed the organization to get more aggressive on their net zero pathway. In fact, one of the cases that caught attention with a lot of board community folks is what happened last year when a small a minority shareholder called Client Earth went after the board at Shell. So I'm sure you're familiar with the, what played out there. Uh, this, this organization partnered with some minority shareholders, uh, some pension funds at Shell, and brought a claim against the board holding them personally liable for inaction on sustainability, personally liable. So it was a derivative claim and derivative claims are complex. The English court kind of killed it in stage one. However, it makes board directors sit up and think that now there are shareholders that may go after them and hold them personally responsible because historically they've been kind of insulated of such action. So with this backdrop, we tried to seek answers to questions like, hey, uh, what are boards doing in the area of sustainability? Are they doing enough? If they're not doing enough, what is pulling them back? What are the reasons they are not able to kind of drive decisive action on sustainability? Can we learn from boards that are further ahead in the journey and so on? Let me share some data sets with you. There's a lot of meat in the report. I'll just share the headlines this morning. So number one, are we doing enough? Now we did 77 interviews uh, with board directors. Some of the interviewees are here, but those were anonymous interviews, so keep guessing. We, we spoke with 77 board directors, and apart from about five or six board directors who questioned the uh, scientific basis of climate change, who questioned the numbers around social inequality, the rest of the directors were singing the same song hey, boards need to do more on sustainability. Board needs, boards need to drive the sustainability agenda more aggressively and so on. If that is true, it should come out in the data that we collected. However, our data tells that 37% or a little more than one in three board directors are telling us that their boards spend either no time discussing sustainability, I repeat, zero time discussing sustainability, or it is discussed once a year. Perhaps that one time when the board comes together to talk about uh, strategy or they, the board does strategic planning for the next year, the subsequent year. Only one in five boards discuss sustainability in every meeting. They deem it important enough to bring it up in all conversations. As you see from the bottom left on the slide, Asia kind of lags on this as compared to Pacific. In Pacific, we looked at New Zealand, Australia, and Japan. The other question we asked was, if this is true, then where are boards spending time? And uh, as you can see on top right, and apologies for small font here, as you see the gray bars there on the top right, you'll realize that boards are mainly spending the bulk of their time on pure play fiduciary duties, which is the right thing to do. They are spending a lot of time looking at historical financial data, historical metrics, uh, spending a fair amount of time talking about risk, spending a fair amount of time uh, talking about audit reports, compliance, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, when we ask board directors, the same group, where should you be spending time if you could have a free will in terms of designing the agenda of the board? This is what we picked up. The blue, the, the blue arrows on the right-hand side and the black bars. The board directors are telling us that they should be spending more time looking beyond pure play fiduciary duties, perhaps bordering on stewardship responsibilities in the organization, looking at culture, looking at adding value, spending time on sustainability, spending time on innovation, on leadership, on talent, on culture building in the organization. However, interestingly, in the interviews, board directors also told us that these agenda items while they aspire to do more of this, it usually gets crowded out because of the limited responsibilities that are asked of the board directors purely to play fiduciary to the trustee or to the shareholder in this case. So are we doing enough? The data doesn't suggest, but I leave this question for this room, all senior board directors here with us. 
Now, when board directors are telling us that, hey, it is important for the boards to drive sustainability agenda and boards should take decisive action, why don't we see it play out? Why are there $43 trillion in sustainability funds while uh, we have no chance to limit the temperature rise where the chasm between the haves and have nots is increasing? Perhaps the reason lies bases our research on two elements, intent or intentionality and ability. When I say intent, I mean the mindsets, I mean purpose, I mean values that board directors have to embrace uh, the sustainability agenda authentically. And when I say ability, I mean the capability of the board to integrate business with sustainability, to get the right leadership structure at the board level, to also uplift the capability of the board in understanding of sustainability, come up with processes and systems, uh, incentive plans, or culture building initiatives to drive the sustainability agenda in the organization. Now our research points that boards that are able to do both have the right intent and have the right ability, even though intentionality or intent precedes ability. Boards that are able to do that, they are able to push their management teams to do the right thing, to do well by doing good. They not only prepare their organizations to survive in the world that we live in, but also thrive in the future. These are the boards that we call true stewards in our research. Now, what drives intent and ability? We did some digging around on that basis, the data that we collected, and we came up with a fairly complex looking uh, root causing tree. But not to scare you, there are six reasons, six key reasons that we identified. Three reasons for driving intent and three reasons for driving uh, you know, uh, ability or readiness of the organization. On the intent side, it is a function of jurisdiction readiness. So where does the organization sit? What is the maturity of the institutions in those, in, in, in those countries? What are the dominant mindsets in those countries with the leaders that we are talking about? Company readiness, what is the ownership structure of the organization? What is the industry that the company sits in? Because if you're in transition industry, the intent is slightly different as compared to, let's say, if you're a professional services firm. And, um, what is the point of view of the CEO in that organization? What is the, uh, what is the business that it is in? And what is the scope of operations? Because if you are based in Sri Lanka exporting uh, uh, you know, fabric to let's say Europe, there is a different pressure which causes different intentionality in organizations to embrace sustainability. On the ability side, it is mainly about board leadership. And when I say board leadership, it is the role of the chair. Also, the dynamics at the board level. Is it all dialogue and no decision, or is it all decisions without a dialogue? They are both two ex extremes, uh, not good for the board. So what is the board culture? What does the diversity metric on the board look like? Are there different views that are being, in being invited by the chair, or are decisions being taken without caring about what the rest of the board says? Also, uh, the skill level on the board, not only the existing skill level, but the, uh, but I would say the, the, the urgency of upgrading the skill level on the board, bringing new talent in, bringing consultants in to work with the board to help them understand the nuances of sustainability. And third, the, the business integration element. Are there processes and systems in place to integrate sustainability with business? Are there uh, systems in place or incentive systems or incentive structures in place to shape behavior in the organization? Are there initiatives to drive the culture of the organization towards sustainability? So these are the key reasons. There's a lot of meat in the report on each of these buckets, but just sharing the headlines here. Now, let me share with you some high level data that we collected on some of these nodes. The good news is one in three board directors are telling us, or about 34% of board directors are telling us that they pursue sustainability because it is the right thing to do. It is the purpose of the organization, which is good news. So, you know, at least a third of the board directors have their hearts in the right place, that they are pursuing sustainability because it is the right thing to do and the organization believes in that. However, it gets interesting here. Two out of five board directors or 41% of respondents are telling us that regulator is the key driver in driving some sustainability at the board level. Any decisive action on the board on sustainability is because the regulator is driving that action. That is the number one driver. So a lot of boards are looking outwards for inspiration. There's nothing wrong in it. And you know, the regulators have been fairly active in recent times. 
However, when you do it under pressure from either the regulator or your customer or your client, in that case, we, it, there's a tendency to get into a compliance mindset rather than, hey, let me go out and do the right thing here. Interestingly, when we looked at uh, the biases that are dominant at the board level, biases such as short-termism, biases such as profit maximization, sustainability being a zero-sum game, those are the biases that we picked up in our, our data sets. On the ability side, three out of four board directors are telling us that lack of knowledge is the number one staller, number one challenge as we embrace sustainability at the board level. However, rather ironically, only one in four boards uh, make it mandatory for incoming board directors to have knowledge or expertise in sustainability. So while we want more knowledge, we are not walking the talk when we are bringing new board directors in. Finally, boards are kind of myopic when they are looking at the governance of sustainability. Now, if you are an industry in transition, you would typically have a sustainability committee dedicated to looking at sustainability on the board. For the rest of the organizations that are not in transition, usually, it is relegated to one individual at the board level or one individual or a team uh, at the executive level. Very few boards are uh, setting it as a whole board responsibility. Consider it important enough to be a whole board accountability and responsibility. In other organizations, usually it is added to the charter of the existing committees and basis our interviews, what we hear that sustainability agenda often gets crowded out because these committees, they have their own core agenda, either audit or governance or remuneration and so on. Um, and as I said, only one in five boards take it up in, in, in all the meetings and take it up uh, as a regular responsibility of the entire board. So this is what is playing out. When you look at the drivers that drive intent and ability, these drivers shape the personality of the board. These drivers shape the context in which the board operates. And uh, when we analyze the interview data, we realize that there are five personalities that were coming out basis the drivers of intent and ability. And these drivers, as I said again, are shaping the context in which our board operates. And I'm not judging here. All I'm saying is that different boards have different personalities shaped by different uh, you know, contexts in which they operate. Now, uh, as you can see here, passive followers are the boards that do not engage on sustainability proactively. These are boards uh, that decide uh, not to take active action on sustainability because either they are ignorant or they choose to be ignorant or they are waiting for a push by an external party, regulator in most cases. Now, when I'm in conversations and I hear, hey, sustainability is important, I understand, I empathize, I want to take action, but listen, there are more priorities at this point to deal with. We are dealing with a tough economic cycle, a tough business situation. In my mind, immediately, it's a passive follower board. If that, if that, if that uh, thinking is shared by the entire board, it's a passive follower board for me. Box checker boards are the ones that spend disproportionate amount of time on compliance. As long as we comply uh, on all the regulatory requirements, all the regulations, we are good. And we're not blaming those boards. Regulations, regulators are on an overdrive in times that we speak in. You know, there are so many to-dos or activities that boards need to take care of or organizations need to take care of. New regulations, new frameworks being introduced as we speak. You know, ISSP, SBTI, TNFD, TCFD, there's an entire alphabet soup there uh, in terms of uh, embracing it by the boards. But box checker boards are only concerned with checking the boxes, meeting the compliance requirements, and no more. Do-gooder boards are the ones that believe in the moral responsibility of sustainability. They believe that uh, it is the responsibility of the organization because of the religious belief that the organization may have or the dominant religious belief or the jurisdiction. For instance, in India, you are expected to, uh, you are mandated to spend X percent of your profit on CSR or because of the values of the founding member or the founding family, these boards uh, pursue sustainability as a moral responsibility. That it's a responsibility of the company to keep aside a part of the profit for benefit of society. These 
organizations will go out and build schools, build hospitals, clean up the rivers, build parks, and do a whole lot of activities uh, for society to make the world a better place. However, while they are doing a lot of good, and God bless these companies, there is a weak materiality link between what they are doing and the strategy of the organization. On the other end of the spectrum, risk mitigators or uh, risk navigators are the boards that are uh, constantly thinking about the risk to the organization. A lot of companies in transition would sit here. Now, these are companies or boards that are constantly looking at risks, are only looking at risks, if you will, the outside in risk to the organization and taking actions to solve those, solve for those risks. Uh, very close integration between sustainability and business strategy in these organizations. However, using only the risk lens. To the contrary, your true steward boards are the ones that not only look at risks, but they spend a lot of time talking about sustainability opportunities. Now, data suggests that there is over $10 trillion worth of business that is sitting out there till 2030 in the sustainability area. These are the boards that go after the opportunity piece. These boards not only integrate sustainability with strategy, sustainability is the number one strategy in true steward boards, or most of true steward boards. These boards will nudge their management teams to go and embrace the do well and do good agenda to go and make money and leverage the opportunities that these existential challenges are throwing at us. True steward boards, as I said earlier, not only prepare their organizations for uh, success in current times, but financial success and sustainability success in the longer term. Now, again, these are not static, uh, these are not static phases in which you operate. These are the personalities of the board shaped by the contexts in which you operate. The question I have for you this morning is that you're all senior directors. Are you comfortable with where you sit, where, what your board personality is? Do you want to do something about it? Do you want to take action about it? Because if you want to, a good place to start is to reflect on, first of all, who you are. Why are you a part of this board? Is it a social calling card for you? And that is true for a lot of board directors. Uh, and I might get beaten up because all of you are board directors. But are you there due to a social calling card or are you there because you really want to make a difference? What is the mindset, collective mindset of the board? Is it a mindset of sustainability risk or, or sustainability opportunity? Is it a mindset where sustainability is seen as a zero sum game or is it a mindset of growing the pie? Is it a mindset that is inside out? We should pursue sustainability because it is the right thing to do. Or is it a mindset where we are reacting outside to outside in pressure? Also, it is, a, it, is it a mindset wherein we are doing uh, sustainability because we need to do it and we need to check the boxes? Or is it a mindset that, hey, you know, the world needs help and corporations need to step up and take the right actions? We need to look at the mindsets of the board and reflect on those. Then we also need to look at if, if we really want to make a difference, what is pulling us back? You know, we need to understand the drivers of ability and intentionality and what is pulling us back. Glad to share that there is a quick diagnostic, a five minute diagnostic that you can use to identify which of those six pillars that I was talking about earlier when I was talking about intentionality and ability, which of those pillars may be pulling you back. You can identify that using a quick diagnostic. As a researcher, I must tell you, it's not a validated diagnostic, it is based on the data that we collected in this research. Once you evaluate that, you must discuss at the board level whether you are happy with the personality of the board, the archetype of the board, the context in which the board operates. Again, we have a simple diagnostic, a 10 question reflective diagnostic to very quickly figure out where you sit on the matrix that you see here of the five archetypes. And if you really want to make a difference and you're not happy uh, with where you sit, you want to embrace true stewardship or you want to be a true steward boards, there is a way to do that. You know, based on Stewardship Asia Center's 10 years of research where we've looked at hundreds of organizations to identify what differentiates organizations that are cut above the rest on sustainability, we know that it is what we call steward leadership which is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future for all stakeholders. Organizations that embrace steward leadership are the ones that are cut above the rest in sustainability. 
for boards that want to pursue the true steward agenda, they need to embrace steward leadership in their DNA or in, their, uh, in the fabric of their organization. As you can see on the left hand, of the, uh, left hand side of the slide, there is a steward leadership compass that these boards and, th and these organizations need to embrace. And the compass comprises of four values that differentiate these organizations. Value of interdependency that, hey, I can't do it alone. If I have to do it, I need to partner with the stakeholders. I need to partner with the customers. I need to partner uh, with the regulators, with the government. Value of long-term thinking. I can't, I can't keep pushing my teams for quarterly targets for missing their monthly numbers if I want them to think longer term in the sustainability area. Ownership mentality. If somebody has to do it, it is me as a chair. It is my board. It is me as an independent director. Me as a CEO who needs to lead this initiative. We can't keep looking outside the organization for inspiration on driving the sustainability agenda and creative resilience, that we need to innovate, innovate, and constantly innovate to make the most of sustainability opportunities. Also, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, the stewardship purpose sits in the middle of the compass. The purpose of greater good. A purpose, everybody has a purpose in the world, you know, whether we state it clearly or not, but stewardship purpose is the purpose of greater good. So what do you need to do as a board if you are driving uh, the true stewardship agenda? You need to embrace this compass. You need to make sure that you are mindful of the values of the organization when the discussions are happening. You hold the management team accountable for pursuing these values. If these values don't exist in your organizations, uh, you may want to nudge the management team to embrace these values in the overall value system in the enterprise. So we are not only saying you embrace only these four values, these values should be a part of the overall value set of the organization. As a board, we need to be mindful of the purpose of greater good. If the purpose of your organization is uh, not around greater good, a good conversation to have with the organization, uh, with the management team in the organization. And finally, we need to, we as board directors, need to hold the management team accountable for creating a culture, a, a shared culture based on these values and purpose. Only then can we emerge as a true steward board. So we need to start by reflecting uh, about who we are and what the board mindset is. We need to talk about, hey, what are the drivers that are pulling us back? We need to discuss the personality of the board and then we need to embrace true stewardship if we are on this journey. Now, before I let Rajiv come up and uh, bring this research to life with four rockstar board directors, there are three messages I want you to walk out with. Number one, we need to understand the personality of the board that we sit on. And again, I'm not judging here. Wherever you sit is because of the uh, context in which your board, your organization operates. And we need to be aware and we need to ask ourselves, are we comfortable where we sit uh, in the board and the personality of the board? If we aren't, we must embrace true stewardship. Is it easy? Absolutely not. We, need, we will need to be resilient, resilient, we will need all the perseverance that we have to drive that agenda. We'll need to play ball with the management. We'll need to perhaps arm twist the management sometimes, be the activist sometimes to get the organization to do the right thing. However, being senior leaders, I think you have the power vested in you to drive this agenda. So that's number two. Number three, as I said earlier when I started the presentation, the belly of the normal curve when you look at board directors or boards, uh, they're on the fence on sustainability. So if you are on the fence or your board is on the fence on sustainability, I would urge you to consider taking a decisive action on sustainability because it's not only good for the organization, it is good for you. As I said earlier, there may be a shareholder who may come after you at some point. Traditionally, boards have been insulated, but with the directive action, uh, you know, if one of these cases goes through, the floodgates will open. So somebody might come after you and hold you personally liable for inaction. So those are the three thoughts that I want you to leave the room with. There's a lot of meat in the report. Feel free to scan the report. If you want us to come in and share the key findings with your board, we would love to do that. Thank you.